Lord loves you and He's always got your best interest in mind. Amen? He does. I praise the Lord. Stay with me tonight if you would. I want to read a uh, portion of Scripture here. Just a small portion. Might be familiar to some of you. Maybe a little new to some of you. But uh, St. Luke chapter number 10. Jesus has sent the 70 out to proclaim the gospel, to uh, heal the sick, raise the dead, to proclaim the kingdom of God at the hand. <clears throat> As He sent this 70 out, and they came back, they were so confident that they said, Lord, even the devils are subject to us. Jesus told them not to revel or not to be happy just because it's that the devils are subject to you. But be glad that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life in heaven. Amen. I'm glad tonight that my name is written in heaven somewhere. Yes. I'm glad that I've got a name that even though I may not be able to pronounce it, I may not be able to put it into human words, I know when He calls my name. There's something about that voice that I know that my Master has spoken unto me. Amen. I love what Jesus begins to tell them here is the book, the book of Luke. Luke picks it up in chapter number 10, verse number 17. He said, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And He said unto them, I beheld, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Let's bow our head. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. Yes, Lord. Lord, we thank you for everything you've done for us. And Father, if there's anything in our lives, anything in our lives, yes. Lord, that would hinder tonight, and Lord, we ask that the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was shed upon the cross of Calvary and presented in the heavenlies on our behalf. Lord, we ask that that precious blood would cleanse us from all of our sin. Yes. As we place our faith in Calvary, we place our faith in what you've done for us. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would give us the overcoming victory. For Paul said that sin shall not have dominion over you. And we hang on to that tonight, Lord. Father, forgive us of anything that is contrary, anything that is against you. And Father, we'll ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. amen. Turn around somebody next to you. If you don't know them, ask them, your, ask them their name. Tell them that you love them. Turn around to your neighbor there and tell them that you love them. Tonight. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you too. <laughs> Well, they say that if you don't know somebody, you need to ask them their name. And I'm sure that we got a lot of folks that's been coming here. I have to be honest, there's people that come here that's been coming for a long time, and I still don't know their name. And uh, that's, that's, that's sad, because most of the time I remember names real well. Amen. <coughs> Did you know that when you and I were saved and we were born into the kingdom of God through the precious blood of Jesus Christ and our faith in what He did there, that you and I were given benefits and you and I were given privileges and you and I were given rights in the kingdom of God that are subject unto us by the faith that we have in Christ and Him crucified. You've heard me say this over and over and over again, that the power that you and I have as a child of God is found in our faith, and our faith, not just our belief in being able to go forward and to do something, but our faith has to be placed rightly in the Christ and what He did on the cross for you and I. You and I have been given a privilege of being able to be into the family of God 
adopted into the family, but yet even more so than adopted, you and I have been birthed into the family by the precious blood of Jesus Christ who cleanses us from all sin and unrighteousness and invites us to step into the kingdom of God and to be a part of what Christ is doing here on this earth today and in heaven to come. You and I are born into the kingdom and you and I have received this blessed hope, this blessed earnest of the Holy Spirit that's been given to you and I as Christ takes up His abode in our heart through faith and begins to lead and, and, and guide and direct us through the moving of the Holy Spirit. Some people uh, might call it a feeling. Some people might call it intuition. Some people might call it by a whole category of different names. But if you and I are a child of God in this inner voice who is Christ, begins to speak to us and lead and guide us. Now I tell you, some people say, well, I don't know what is God and what is not God. Well, let me tell you, God will always point you to the sacrifice that Jesus Christ provided Amen. for you and I on the cross. When my babies got sick, and she's not a baby anymore, she's still my baby, but they're not babies anymore in, in, a, in a mature way. But when my babies got sick, we purposely went to Christ and what He did on the cross. And we said, Lord, if You could save us from a devil's hell, if You could save us from the, the lake of fire, then Father, we believe in what Christ did on that cross of Calvary, that that, that that power that You did there on the cross that saved us, that same power can heal my child from a fever. Amen. that I don't even understand why this child is sick. I hear these requests all the time. I, I get emails and texts. Please pray for me. Please do this for, for me. Pray for me that I don't understand why my child has this fever. I don't understand why we're going through these things. I don't understand why we're in between a rock and a hard place and a, and a tough place. Well, let me tell you, the enemy comes in and begins to test and begins to wear down on you. You, and Christ is wanting you to make a conscious a choice of choosing Christ and what He has done for you. There's life in Jesus Christ. There's life in what He did for you when He died there on Calvary. And through that life, you have by inheritance received that name and that authority in Jesus Christ. Did you know that that name of Jesus is a name that is above every name and every sickness and disease, every every possible thing that would exalt itself against the most high God, that that, high, that thing that would exalt itself has to fall at the feet of the name of Jesus. And that authority has been given to you and I as the believers. We live so much underneath the authority that has been given to us by the birth into the kingdom that we have received the name of Jesus. This is what Jesus was talking about. He sent this 70 out with authority and they were rejoicing about this authority that they had. But He told them, don't just rejoice in that, but rejoice because your names are written in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven. So the joy that you and I have has to be rooted tonight in what Christ has done for you and I. He defeated sin and He provides a way for you and I to defeat sin on a daily basis. Paul said that he didn't understand why that he wanted to do good things, but yet he found himself doing bad things. And whenever he would will, this is in Romans chapter 6, whenever he would will himself to do the good things, he couldn't begin to find out how to even begin to do the good things. And it frustrated him, much like it frustrates a lot of Christians today. People in the, in the kingdom of God, you, you become frustrated because when you would do good, when you, when you want to live right, when you want to do the right things, you find it almost impossible to make those choices because life is coming at you. And life comes at you faster than you have answers for most of the time. And then whenever you, you, you wouldn't do something, or you say, well, I would never do that, or I would never disgrace my name, or I would never bring shame on the kingdom of God, the next thing you know, you fell into a trap, and you find yourself bringing 
a reproach on the name of Christ and upon the church and upon the kingdom of God. And I know ministers right now, minister friends of mine, that if I would have went back a year, two years ago, and I would have asked them, would you do what you're doing today? They would have said, no, not never. I never would ever do the thing like that. But yet today they find themselves in a position to where they've lost their authority. They've lost their ability to lead people. They've lost their congregation. And they found themselves falling into the sinful trap that they themselves preached against. But I'm going to tell you, your holiness cannot be built upon your ability to carry out holiness. Amen. Your holiness has to be built upon Christ. That, that foundation is not, it can't be what you're doing, but it's got to be what Christ has done for you. Yeah. And this is what Jesus is telling them. He's saying, listen, don't, uh, don't revel and don't party and don't, don't, don't brag and think that, that because the, the devils are, are subject to you and have to do what you tell them to do. Hey, don't think that you're something that you've risen above folly. I want to tell you, Peter was in that crowd. And even in the end, Peter denied the Lord. He said, he even said, it, Lord, I'll follow you all the way. I'll die with you. And in the end, at the crucifixion, we find Peter failing. And I'm sure this had to weigh on him. And it weighs on us as Christians whenever we fail God. Whenever we find ourselves in a place to where we have, we have failed Him and we, we carry this guilt with us. You know, there's, there's nothing uh, more tragic than, uh, than, than, than... I'll use a good example of it. When you lay your motorcycle over on its side, you just drop it. Or you wreck it. It's like you tote that thing with you for weeks. It's almost like there's guilt hung over the top of you. Because you feel like you failed. It's the weirdest thing. I come out through the yard one day with my Harley and I had a little bit of mud and I just slid it right down on its side. It didn't hurt a thing. Didn't hurt a thing on that motorcycle. But I picked that thing up and I dusted the mud off of it and I was sick of it. All I could think was, man, I dropped that thing. Man, I dropped that thing out here in the yard. I just, I just felt bad about it. It just weighed, it weighed heavy on me. And I mean, that might not make much sense to a lot of people. But I felt like I'd done something wrong. And I walked around with that thing for a couple of days. Every time I thought about it, it just made me kind of sick and turn in my stomach. Well, maybe I'm not relating to some of y'all, but you ever done anything that kind of made you sick and turned your stomach? It might not have hurt nobody or anything, but you just kind of thought back and you thought, man, I failed. Man, I messed up. But the fact is that Christ gives us His power to live for Him and to overcome the failures in our life. I know people who have joined the church, who've been saved, joined the church, and then got with some of their old crowd and backslid and sinned and done some things that was unbecoming of a church member and then walked around with a feeling of guilt hung over their head because they had failed God. Well, I want to tell you, Christ gives forgiveness. And what He wants you and I to do when we fail God, whenever you and I fall from, from being able to walk in victory in Him, He doesn't want you and I to walk around feeling guilty and being nagged by the enemy. By, but He wants you and I to come to the cross, the precious blood of Jesus and fall upon what He has done for us and repent and ask the Lord to forgive us of our sin and to pick up and go on. You see, a, a Christian, God never planned on a Christian living a yo-yo Christian life. Think about it. When we got saved, one of the first things we wanted to really, really do in our life is live for the Lord. And we set about to do that. And unfortunately, some people around the church probably decided to help us. And they didn't know. But when you let all this advice pile, and listen, free advice is worth about as much as you paid for it. <laughs> it really is. That's how come when you call me and I give you advice, it costs. 
<laughs> I'm charging for it. No, I'm only kidding. <clears throat> but it is true that a lot of people will try to guide you into living for the Lord. And they'll set you up a bunch of rules. They'll set you up a bunch of guidelines. And you've got to do this. You've got to, you've got to live like this and do this. And then you'll be right with God. But the truth is, is only this book is the standard. And sometimes man has a warped view of this book. Sometimes man places his own interpretation in on what this book says. I hear it all the time. Well, the dress is too short. The dress is too long. You shouldn't have makeup. Well, your old bar needs a little paint. <laughs> Earrings will send you to hell. Smoking will send you to hell. I hear it all. But see, that's, that's man's interpretation of Scriptures. Only Christ can change you and I. Right. Man can help you. Man can kind of lead and guide you along. Man can, can nurture and try to nourish you in your, your Christian walk. But bottom line is, this book is the final authority. And it's what you read out of this book, what you study out of this book, and what God the Holy Spirit speaks into your heart that makes all the difference in your life. Amen? Amen. Listen. Don't believe anything I say until you've checked it out in this book because I'm flesh and I could be wrong. Amen? But I want to tell you, Christ gives you power to overcome sin. He gives you power not only to overcome sin in your life, but He gives you power to do ministry. A few years ago, I was working for my wife's uncle at a transmission shop, building transmissions. And I had a dream one night. I dreamed that me and Fred Hodges, which is the guy that worked with me, who now owns the business, and I dreamed that old Fred and me was out in the back of the shop working one day. And I looked out on the ground, and there was this dude sitting in the grass, Indian style, and he had a bunch of bones and a bunch of sticks and he was throwing them up in the air and he was chanting something that sounded almost like somebody speaking in other tongues. And I'll never forget in this dream that old Fred turns around to me and says, what is that guy doing out there? And I looked at old Fred. Now this is in a dream. I looked at old Fred in my dream and I said, that guy out there is trying to curse He's trying to cast a spell. He is practicing witchcraft. And he's out there trying to put a curse on us. And this is in my dream. And Fred says, well, what are you going to do? And I didn't even answer Fred. I walked out. And this is in my dream. I walked out to where this man was. And he looked up at me. And he said, what are you going to do? And all I did in my dream was say, in the name of Jesus. And in my dream, it was like the biggest cloud of smoke went poof, and He was gone in my dream. Well, I woke up after that. And can I tell you what? I felt the presence of the Lord. And I asked God. I was like, God, what? What is going to... And the Lord spoke to me and says, I've given you power to tread upon scorpions and serpents. And I knew that that dream was from the Lord, but I didn't know what it was all about. I was pastoring a little church over in Atworth, Georgia, Lois and I was, and, and the girls. And we had all these kids out of the housing projects that was coming in. Five different housing projects that was coming over in over there. And in pastoring all these, we had run into a family. This woman had five children, no husband. She had gotten hooked up with a couple of, of real bad drug dealers that Andy and I went to school with. And, and I knew them and I knew how bad it was. Knew what they had been into and what they were capable of. And, and she was fronting drugs for them. And the defects came in and yanked her children from her and, 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 and took them away. Well, the oldest girl, they, they sent her to Ohio to live with her grandmother. Her grandmother said, I, I want her. And so the oldest girl contacts me one day and says, I am in Ohio with the grandma and I don't have no clothes. 
can you go get mama and get her to get my clothes and will you box them up and ship them up here for me to have some clothes? It was getting close to winter time. And so I went to the housing projects, drove down Cruz Street, went down there to the apartment. She wasn't at home. I knew where the drug dealers lived. So I got in the car and I drove over to where the drug dealers lived and sure enough, there she was. And I knocked on the door and I asked her, I said, listen, your oldest daughter has called me and she wants her clothes. Can I get her clothes? We're going to box them up and we're going to send them to Ohio to the grandmother. She said, yeah. So she left. She, get, she gets in the church van with Lois and I and the girls and we're going out Highway 92 going to a storage facility where the clothes are stored. And so we get to Lake Green Road and there's a storage facility and the whole time we're riding there this girl is sitting in between Lois and I kind of there at the doghouse of the van and she's crying. And she's saying, I've really gotten hooked on some bad stuff and I'm in with some bad people and I'm afraid and I fear for my life. And I'm thinking, well, honey, I know these guys. I grew up with these guys. And yeah, you are. You're in with some bad people. And so she was crying. She was saying, pray for me. Pray for me. And I'm listening to all this. I'm listening to this person that's in between a rock and a hard place. A, a, a person who, who said that well, one time they walked with God, but they had gotten away from the Lord and they had went off into sin and they had lost everything they had. They had been kicked out of the housing projects because of the association with the, the drug people and, and the children were gone because defects came in and, and yanked all the children away from her. And now she was dribbling along with these drug people because they were able to support her and so she was fronting the drugs for them so she was in this bad place we're riding in over there we go to these mini storage warehouse we pull in we're back there we're pulling clothes out we're putting them in a box and it was like you know it was that perfect moment of opportunity that Lois and me and Tristan and Katie was all there in the church van with this woman. And we were outside and I just looked at her and, and I asked, I said, Judy, can we pray with you? Can we just have prayer with you? Because we're out here middle of the night, nobody around. Can we just pray with you? And she said, yeah, I, I would like that. I would like for you all to pray with us. So Lois and I started praying for her out there in the parking lot. And she started sinking. She kind of started sinking toward the ground. And when she laid out on the ground, there was this voice that came out of this woman. <laughs> you have never heard a voice like that in all of your life. As these demonic spirits that was in this woman began to talk through this woman and talk to us. That spirit said, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to take her life from her. And this was a man's voice. There was a voice, another voice that came forth and it almost sounded like somebody who was, who was mentally off. There was three or four different voices that came out of that woman that night. Different voices as she lay there on the ground and we began to pray over her. Well, I tell you what, I heard my daddy talk about that. I've never encountered it. I heard my daddy talk about it growing up. I heard about my grandpa encountering it. But that's the first time that I'd ever seen it in my whole life. I believe God gave me that dream about the garage to prepare me for what, about, what was about to happen. And we should always pay attention to what's going on around our life. Lois and I started praying over her and these voices started manifesting and coming out of this lady. This is America. This is not a third world country. This is America. This is Georgia. Where things ain't supposed to happen like that in the Bible Belt. Ain't nobody supposed to be that bad. Well, I, I know the one on your carport over there is the same thing, but we began to pray over Lois and I did, and these demons started speaking to us. And Lord, we got the Bible out and laid it on the ground, started quoting scripture, started doing all kinds of things. And every 
every time that we would command a spirit to come out, she would writhe and scream just like a snake and like somebody dying. And this went on for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. I, I got amused, though, in the middle of all this at my daughter's because Tristan's sitting in the church van singing to the top of her lungs, I love you, Lord. I didn't want to hear it. Because she didn't want to hear what was happening out there on the pavement. And I hear Katie over there, who's about six or seven years old, going, shh, shh, I want to hear. I want to hear. So Katie, Katie was interested in it. So we began to pray for this lady and, and these demons were manifesting and, and being cast out. And Lois was there and I was there and we were praying and I saw a light go by one of the buildings. And when I looked up, it was a Cherokee County Sheriff's car. And then there was lights that lit up behind us and it was another Cherokee County Sheriff's car. We didn't know that there was a woman sleeping in the office that had a perfect shot of us with that woman laying on the ground screaming and hollering while we were praying. And the lady in the office thought somebody was being attacked and had called the sheriff's office. And so here come the patrol cars. And the guy jumps out and I stood up. I got a Bible laying on the ground. Lord stood up and he said, what's going on here? And before we could get a word out, that woman stood up and said, they're praying for me. I need help. And so one cop turned around and asked us, is this what's going on? And then another one went over there where Tristan was at and started talking to her through the window of the van. Is this what's going on? Is this what they're doing? And, and, and they said yes. And the cops looked around at Lois and I and he said, well, I guess we're just having church here tonight then, aren't we? <laughs> He said, but I tell you, y'all got to quit because that woman up yonder is upset that y'all down here did. And I left that night. We left that night and I felt like that there was something so undone. I felt like something had been left so unending. Like something needed more. Something more needed to happen. A, a cleansing needed to happen more. And, and, I, and I complained to the Lord. I said, Lord, we didn't get to finish. We got started and it's like the devil won. And I complained to the Lord about it. And it was like the Lord kept speaking to me and saying, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But I did worry about it. I did worry that we didn't get to finish what we were doing. I said, well, we didn't get them all out. They didn't all leave. And it was like the Lord spoke and said, don't worry about it. And so for the next few months, we wondered. We didn't know. We didn't know. She disappeared. Didn't know if a drug dealer got her and took her off and killed her or what. She just poof, disappeared off the face of the earth. Didn't know what had happened to her. About two years later, probably about two years after that incident, I got a phone call one day. She says, hey, Pastor Weeks, this is Judy. Or Judy. I was like, Judy who? She said, Judy, do you remember the woman that you and your wife was praying for down there? in those many warehouses that night, the law came. I was like, yeah, Judy. Oh, it's good to hear from you. How have you been? She said, I want to tell you what happened that night. She said, that was the turning point of my life right there that night. She said, because of that night, she said, I'm up here in Ohio living with my mother I've got all my children back. I'm back in church. And I've been teaching Sunday school for over a year. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, see there, I told you, it's my business. It's my business, not your business. What you thought wasn't finished, I'm capable of finishing the job. So I want to tell you, 
When you feel like that sin is encroaching on you, and you feel like that you're fighting with all your might to fight away sin, trust in what Christ did on that cross for you. Trust in what Jesus Christ has accomplished for you on that cross and allow the Holy Spirit to do the rest of the work. You and I are God. Your preacher tonight is not God. Your church you attend wherever, whoever it is, is not God. We're limited. We can only do certain things and only go as far as, as humanity at times. But God is unlimited. And what He did for you and I on the cross of Calvary, it's forever ongoing. When He saved me, He didn't quit saving me. He's saving me tonight. He'll be saving me tomorrow. He's leading and He's guiding. This is why the writer could say the steps of a good man or the steps of a good woman are ordered of the Lord. There's a reason you're here tonight. You're here in this place tonight. Well, not only did you eat some good squash casserole with Andy Ames made, you never made them cornbreads down there on the end. Whoever made that coleslaw, I'll be talking to you later on and find out who it was. But you're here tonight for a purpose. You're here tonight because God loves you. And God wanted you to hear this. And I tell you, you know, I could go on with story after story after story of the things that I have seen the Lord do. We had a lady, same thing, in, over there in the carport one night years ago. Same exact, same situation, same thing went on. We had a lady come to our house. I tell you, the Lord, the Lord has given the believer.